We're going live. All right, welcome everyone to Cooking Up Mystery. Today we're going to be talking about food, what's on everybody's mind two days before Thanksgiving, right? And, um, and how it works into your novels. Um, so let me introduce everybody. I'm going to go around. Um, uh, I'll start with Joy on my left. Um, Joy writes the Deep Lakes Mysteries in northern Wisconsin, where her protagonist, Frankie Champagne, owns Bubble and Bake, a bakery wine bar. Mysteries abound in Frankie's world. Uh, Jacqueline Vick, on the other side of me, writes the Frankie Chandler Pet Psychic Mysteries. Her main character is a terrible cook, I hear, uh, with a really good sense of humor. And Lori Buchanan writes suspense thriller set at a writing retreat in Northern Washington. One of her main characters is, N N I Neil, always want to say Neil, Neil McCulloch, <laughs> the, at, and he's the cook at the retreat. Characters often sit around the table eating fancy fare while discussing the latest crimes. Christine Desmat writes the fudge shop mystery set in Door County, Wisconsin. Her character, Ava Osterling, owns you guessed it, a fudge shop. And frequently she has a crime to solve. Um, Cheryl Joseph writes middle grade mystery. And one of her characters is a Hawaiian named Moki who loves to cook. His dishes and baked goods often show up in her books. And last but not least, Sarah Lynn writes the detective parrot mysteries set in the Brandywine Valley. Um, her book, Murder in the 1%, begins with a pivotal event and an elaborate nine-course meal with nine pairings, wine, pa wine pairings, not nine pairings, wine pairings <laughs> for each course. Welcome, ladies. Hi. Hey. Glad to be here. Happy Good to be, be here. here. Sarah Lynn, um, I want to start with you since your book opens with this giant feast. What inspired you to set a murder mystery around this Epicurean delight? Well, uh, some years ago, I went to a big Epicurean feast in Brandywine Valley, very similar to the one in Murder in the 1%. Mm -hmm. And it struck me when I was at that nine course meal with nine wine pairings that, um, it would be a perfect place to set a murder mystery. And the reason it, that struck me so is because it was such a gorgeous table and such an elaborate meal, such an elegant guest list. And it's the last place in the world you would expect a murder to take place. So that was how the idea came to me. And that was how the pivotal event came to me also. Oh, that's really cool. Um, and then, so you had to talk about all those courses. Right, right. Yeah, I did. And later when I was writing a blog post about that, I did some research on how much that menu would cost. <clears throat> and just the wine for that evening for 13 guests at the table was twenty eight thousand five hundred? Oh my gosh! Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! So there really are dinner parties like that. Oof. I imagine. I'm I was not just lucky them. to be invited to one of them. <laughs> That's really cool, Lori Buchanan. What do you hope to accomplish with the scenes that are set around food and wine pairing in your mysteries? Well, I want my readers to feel at home at Pines and Quill or the desire to go there. And there's nothing better than food. Food makes us think about home. So it's food, food, and more food. Uh, Neil brings it out and they talk about it and, and they ooh and ah over it. And I want 
people to relate with that. All of us, uh, I can't think of anybody that can't relate with eating and most of us enjoy it. Most, some of us enjoy it more than others, myself included. And that's what I want. I, I want to bring the readers into the main house at Pines and Quill and to smell it and, and, and be there and basically tasting it and want to be there. Absolutely. And, and I've read some of your, I've read both your books and ah, those meals just make my mouth water. Good. Yes. <laughs> um, Joy, your book centers around the Scandinavian philosophy called Heige. I think I'm pronouncing that wrong. Uga. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. And if you ever saw the word, you'd know, understand why I'm exactly. pronouncing it. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so how does Huga uh, relate to the bakery and wine lounge setting in your mysteries? Yeah. Um, well, Frankie Champagne, who is my protagonist, um, she learned how to bake from her Danish grandmother and um, who told her lots of Scandinavian stories, but most importantly said that the main ingredient that you put in everything you make is love. And, um, and so Frankie's baking, she's always inspired by her grandmother. And so that Danish concept of huga has, has infiltrated all of Bubble and Bake. She set up Bubble and Bake to be a place where people want to linger longer. So it's a very inviting place. The aromas, um, there's all these little alcoves and, and, um, and little spaces that are created very intimately with fairy lights and, and the smell of the bakery and the wine flows freely and people are invited to sit around and have conversation and, and just kind of forget about anything else in life. And that relates to the idea of huga, which is that the practice of coziness and what better thing to do in a cozy mystery than have a setting where you can practice coziness and kind of let all your worries melt away. And that's, um, that's the atmosphere that's created in the bubble and bake. I love that idea. And, and all of you have written such great settings, by the way, that it, it, they're places that you want to go and visit. Um, Christine, why did you choose this setting of your novels of Door County? Well, it has to do with the coziness that we were just talking about and the, uh, the sense of community. Um, I, I need to say a little bit about Door County. It's a peninsula in Lake Michigan. And in the 1800s, we had Norwegians, Belgians, Swedes come over. And the first thing they did, of course, was fishing. And so a lot of fish is what you do in, in Door County. You have fish boils, which are outdoor in big steel drums and everybody sits around and shares in your strangers there on vacation, you know, from Chicago or wherever. And so it's all about community. Um, and from that, I decided to write about fudge because it's part of the four F words that <laughs> describe Door County and, and what the setting is for my book books and those are the fishing, the forestry, the farming, and the fudge. Um, it's very, that very much uh, reflects the history of Door County and the setting and the kind of foods we have. Farming, for example, Ava Oosterling, her parents run a farm and her mother has a creamery. So the cream for the fudge comes from that creamery. Um, and so, and the fudge itself represents all of the tourism that is popular in Door County because it's the Cape Cod of the Midwest. Um, so I'm also all about cozy food and outdoor food. And this time of year is about the Kermis in Door County. That's the Harvest Festival when everybody has buya, And buya is that big hearty soup uh, that's built about by the community in a big steel drum over a fire. And everybody gets together. Every community has a kermis. Every community knows about Buya. And if you have old ice cream tubs, you take your tub with you to the big boy Buya festival and you bring some home. Wow. That sounds really cool. It does. It is. It's fun. Um, Jacqueline, Jacqueline, Jackie. Um, 
how does your character, uh, by the way, your book, The Scaly Tale of Murder has, I hear, a Thanksgiving scene. Well, the thing, well, she references a Thanksgiving scene from a short story called Trouble with Turkeys. Uh -huh. which, yeah, Frankie's not a good cook. <laughs> She's right. learning. She's learning. Um, in Trouble with Turkeys, um, she decides she's going to, it's going to be her, their first Thanksgiving dinner that she's cooked, the first Thanksgiving dinner with uh, Detective Martin Bowers, and she's going to do it big time. And so she goes and gets, picks out a turkey from a turkey farm um, and everything goes wrong. Like she thinks that undressed obviously means that they pulled all the feathers out, which an undressed turkey has everything in it and the feathers on. So she gets that and has to deal with that. So oh. Yeah, she's um, she's not a good cook, <laughs> but she's trying. And now that she's getting married, she's going to have to learn. And fortunately, Bauer's sister, June, is a good cook. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really fun. Um, Cheryl, um, since writing about food lies mainly in the emotional work that um, that cooking for dining with type of food and the mood of meal entails, it's important to ask, what does the cooking or dining experience mean to your characters? So. Moki's a, a foodie, he's from right. Hawaii and he loves food. And uh, one of the other characters, Ronnie uh, from India has synesthesia and her synesthesia is lexical gustatory, which means when she hears or sees a word, a certain word could be a name, whatever, she tastes something and sometimes smells something. And so Moki and Ronnie are often talking about food. And sometimes it has something to do with a clue in the book. For example, in some of my, a uh, couple of my books, there's a masked character and the word mask makes Ronnie taste mac and cheese. And so Moki often starts talking about mac and cheese and it kind of drives Ronnie nuts. A little bit, but in the third book, um, Walnut Street Phantom Writer, um, the the food discussion there uh, kind of drives the plot a bit, um, actually a lot, because Moki's talking about mac and cheese, and then another character comes along and brings the ingredients for it to the ranch house. So the kids end up staying up late one night and taking over the kitchen and making all of their favorite dishes. And of course, Ronnie makes mac and cheese and et cetera. And while they're in the kitchen, um, it, it gets very late and they, they have to clean up, stop and clean up. And as they're going out the back door to walk across, across the barnyard to go to the bunkhouse, in rides the Phantom Rider. So that, that's how it's all kind of tied in. Yeah. Yeah, and, and for all of you, um, I feel like that's a really good question. Um, how, how does the food and all of that come into the story to, to help with the mystery or um, to enhance the reader's um, perception of what's happening? Anybody can take that. Well, food can be a vehicle for poison. And so the food is sometimes suspect in a mystery because whoever's eaten it and died or gotten sick, um, it could be from the food. And I want to make a comment real quickly because of Christine's comment about bouillon. One of the fancy foods at the party in Murder in the 1% is bouillon base, which is a fish soup. A right. very, very fancy fish soup. So I'm sure those come from the same root word. So thanks, Chris. Yeah. Well, <laughs> now I'm hungry. Yeah. <laughs> Tracy, to answer that question a little differently, in the first yeah. book, well, in, in all of the Sean McPherson novels, Hemingway is an Irish wolfhound, and he's somewhat of the mascot at Pines and Quill. And one of the very, very very bad guys was going to poison Hemingway by putting poison in his food and he did and I'm not going to give away how that didn't come about but Hemingway is alive and well but that they were <laughs> going goodness. to poison the dog 
to, to, to con further their crime activity, but it didn't work out. So there's, there's another, an, another food effort there. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and to even maybe totally different direction, my uh, main character, Frankie, she's moonlighting as a, as an investigative reporter. So her, her bakery is a vehicle for her to kind of soften up people to get them, break them down to get them to talk <laughs> so she so she actually tries to use it as a crime solving technique like i'm going to get these people to talk to me because i'm going to bring them bakery from my shop or a bottle of wine from my vineyard and <laughs> and that's kind of that's how that's how it works in her mystery world i like that that's a good technique <laughs> <laughs> You know, and the, food, food winds up being like a character developer for in, in my books because Frankie's so bad at it. And then with the Harlow brothers, Edwards, I mean, he writes the, an etiquette column. So it brings out his personality when someone uses the wrong fork or what have you. But also when you're sitting around a table with the suspects, like at Inglenook Resort, they're usually not going to get up and run away in the middle of dinner. So it's a good relaxing way to suss out some, you know, answers. Absolutely. Yeah. Add in one more thing. Um, my characters often get together in the kitchen to cook and it is, that's only going to reinforce their friendship, the deep friendship that they have as detectives, as well as neighbors and friends. And, um, that's a message I want to get across the kids. Many kids like, because my books are for ages nine to 12, unlike the rest of yours. Um, and many kids love to cook. I did as a, as a kid. I love to get out in the kitchen, especially making cookies. And so when the kids go out in the kitchen, they're having fun. And so I'm trying to show kids that this is something you can do that um, doesn't necessarily involve um, you know, social media or your phones or your electronics, unless of course you're reading the menu off the internet <laughs> or the recipe, but um, it's a way to get away from, kind of to unplug and to get out into the kitchen and have some fun doing other things, which can only help them as detectives and, and as, for, as well as friends. Yeah, absolutely. And those are all really great answers. Um, so, you know, food is a very sensory um, subject too. Um, how do you bring the reader to the table and engage her in a sensuous apprehension of the food and the surroundings? Um, because for the most part, the surroundings also enter into like you guys were talking about the setting. Um, but how can you bring the reader into the experience of the food itself? Through our, our, our smell, <laughs> my, my writing coach happens to be on this call. She's dead center in the thing for me. And when I turn in a chapter to Miss Christine, if I have not described the smell, um, I get demerits. <laughs> and, and so I've gotten to where I know, I know what she's going to ask me. I try to uh, pre-think what, you know, she's going to want another color. What did it smell like? What did it feel like? That kind of a thing. So I entice the reader with the sense of smell because typically they're coming into the main house. They're not walking directly into the, to the open plan kitchen dining area. They have to come down a hallway, but they're starting to smell this. It's wafting their way, or they might be coming through the mudroom where Hemingway is, has a Dutch door. He's very tall. He's a 150 pound Irish wolfhound, very, very tall. So they keep the bottom of the Dutch door closed so that he can you know be part of the festivities without having a pony next to you eating <laughs> off your plate so um wherever people are coming in at they're smelling first mm -hmm. and Absolutely. i use sounds a lot sounds are important um uh we have a lot of old uh dishes and dishware in my books uh, very you know antique type dishes from grandma and grandpa and ancestors and what I like is that clink of the old china when you're laying out the table for a dinner. And I use that a lot in my, in my books. And I also have Ava go and visit with her grandpa and grandma while they're making food. And it's that sound in the kitchen of, you know, 
moving the coffee pot to the table, pouring the coffee, all of these sounds are very emotional. And I like the idea of sound connected to food as well. It's very true. There's my character Moki who um, isn't really savvy about like which fork to use <laughs> at the place setting. Um, he often will um, accidentally almost knock over the crystal goblet and this kind of thing, you know. Um, and of course, um, he's always, as we're talking about this aromas, where he's very sensitive to that as well as Ronnie. And he'll, they'll be in the middle of talking about some clue and Mulkey will say, I smell tacos and he'll take off for the kitchen or something like that, you know. And I think that's kind of typical of what kids do. I think kids are very tuned into tastes and smells of food and uh, perhaps more than us adults because they, their palates aren't as developed and they know right away if they like something or don't like something. And they're very reluctant sometimes to try new foods. So Moki, I think, is trying to show them the way to try something new, take a risk at the, at the fancily set di dinner table, <laughs> for example. One thing I like to do is show how different people eat differently. So in the Brandywine Valley Mysteries, we have the, the top 1% elite of the country, uh, the wealthiest people in the country, and they're eating very exotic gourmet foods and wines. And then there are the people that are solving the mystery who serve these people and their tastes in food are much, much different. Like chili and cornbread is a wonderful meal for Detective Parrot. So I like to show the contrast between uh, characters, sometimes by how they dress, sometimes by how they eat. Well, Frankie you uses doing. visuals. Frankie, like when she makes um, lasagna for the first time for Bowers, she just looks at it and she's like, it, it looks like lasagna when it's done. So it, I think I did okay, which she did not. But um, so she, she kind of judges it by, well, that's what it looked like when mom made it. <laughs> or that's what the sauce looked like when mom made it. So it should be fine, right? <laughs> you know. I noticed that Bowers goes out and gets food at a deli uh, quite often. <laughs> yes, it's going to go broke. <laughs> <laughs> And, and then just recently, yesterday, in fact, when I got something back from Christine, she had me describe something and it never occurred to me that somebody wouldn't know what a chilaquila is. And I grew up just across the border from Tijuana. And so I, it just never, it never occurred to me that somebody wouldn't know what that is. So she said, somebody might not know what this is. I you better describe <laughs> it. And so you're going to get the book and you'll read it. And I've got a full description there now. Christine will get it back on Monday. Yeah, so she's not going to tell you here. I, you can't make assumptions, you know, just because I'm from like, like Booyah, I wouldn't have known that. And it's second nature to you. So that's, that's just, you know, it just didn't cross my mind. Mm -hmm. A good point. I think that's why we also put recipes right within the text. We don't save them for the end of the book. And I sneak in some recipes within the story itself. So you have to read the mystery to find out what they're talking about. If you want um, an ice cream omelet, for example, you're going to have to read my book. I don't have that recipe in the back. Um, uh -huh. and that's a lot of fun too for readers, just discovering food. As you read along, you discover something new like that, like Lori was just saying. Yeah, I love that idea. How much of your own life experiences and skills are used to form your um, protagonists or your characters or your cooking in your books? <laughs> well, you know, I started with the um, thinking about doing an etiquette author because um, I, I remember, it, I think it was like 20 years old and there was an outdoor um, party at my parents' house and I walked to the back to the table and there was this gentleman there, um, Bill Downing, and you know, always wore a suit, even like while everybody else is in shorts and stuff. And he stood uh, when I approached the table and I didn't plan on sitting down. So I'm yep, 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 yapping away. And then it started to dawn on me, he's not gonna sit down until I do. 
or else I leave, you know, and, and that was just old fashioned good manners. And, and so that, that got me thinking about manners and um, things that people don't often do nowadays that used to be second nature, not even just a couple of decades ago. And really that's true. how I came up with Edward. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, I learned how to bake from my mom from the time I was a little kid. She taught me early on because I was number six of seven kids and um, she didn't have time for me to be pestering her in the kitchen. I needed to be busy. So I learned how to measure and, and, and then pretty soon I was following a recipe and pretty soon I was doing my own baking and absolutely loved it and could be creative. And she was very encouraging, even though I'm sure I made a lot of messes. Um, <laughs> and my parents belonged to a German wine club. So they had um, yeah, a, a wine expert came to our house when I was a teenager and talked about not just the area, uh, not just the wines that themselves, but all these areas of Germany where these wines came from. And I was fascinated. Um, and that was the beginning of learning about tasting wines and, 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 and just wine discovery. And then um, Wisconsin has over 100 wineries. So I've just had the chance to develop that wine tasting <laughs> as, as, um, <laughs> as that has occurred and unfolded. And so it was, it seemed like a natural pairing for me in my own book to say, oh, if I were going to run a business, I'd run a bakery and a wine lounge. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up um, with my grandmother living with us, and she was a great baker, um, especially on rainy days. Uh, we would get into the kitchen together, and she would make cakes and pies and cinnamon rolls, homemade cinnamon rolls and the dough, from the dough on up. It was fabulous. Um, and I, so I learned how to do those kind of things. But um, being a typical kid, you know, I came up with some kind of strange combinations of foods sometimes, including one of my very favorite sandwiches, which was a mustard sandwich. And what do you think's in a mustard sandwich? Mustard. <laughs> mustard. Yeah, that's about it. It's bread with butter and mustard. And and my mother would always say, you know, don't you want some cheese or some turkey or something? I says, no then it wouldn't be a mustard sandwich. So that made its way into book three. One of the characters makes a mustard sandwich to Moki's consternation. Because Moki's <laughs> much more sophisticated than just mustard sandwiches. <laughs> oh, that takes me back to uh, peanut butter and pickle sandwiches when I was a kid <laughs> and we put those in our lunchbox. Mom even made those and said, those are good for you. <laughs> obviously there wasn't anything else in the house on that day and that's why we <laughs> Decent. I actually like them. Go ahead, Lori. In my books, Neil McCullough, the cook, is based completely on my husband, Len, who is a, just a phenomenal cook. And he, after he retired from the military, he was a wine distributor. So he does the pairings. He knows a lot about wines. And he's a phenomenal, phenomenal cook. And it's based totally on him. Libby, his wife, is based a lot on me. Cynthia is based on, the, her appearance is based on my sister, but some of her skill set, some of the intuitive things she does is based on me. So my characters have some real life um, pull from there, a snip from here, a little bit from there uh, that, work, that work in. Yeah. It helps you know your characters better, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you, Sarah Lynn? Well, there's a recipe in um, A Palette for Love and Murder, which is, again, one of the Brandywine Valley mysteries. And it's for a barley, mush mushroom barley soup that uh, one of my friends brought over to my house when I lost my mother. And I was grieving over my mother and she said, you know, this is comfort food, this mushroom barley soup. So there's someone who dies and there's someone who's grieving in that book. 
and I have mushroom barley soup as a comfort food in the book. So I think so much of what we write and what we put on our tables in our scenes actually comes from real life and the associations that we make emotionally with certain foods at certain times of our lives. Oh, I think that's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, so do any of you use food and drink in your books to distinguish certain characters from one another? Um, for example, in one of my books, um, I have a character who only drinks Perrier and he's, he doesn't drink alcohol at all, but he, you can always find him with a Perrier with lime. Do you use food to distinguish or to help characterize any of your characters? Well, I think in my book, Grandpa always likes really hearty breakfast and I'm always referencing the waffles and pancakes that Grandma makes. And she makes huge stacks of them because Grandpa can go through a dozen, you know, on a certain winter's morning, uh, a dozen pancakes or something. So I'm always referencing those extra pancakes that Ava then takes up to her bed and breakfast for her guests because there's just so many pancakes and waffles <laughs> that Grandma has to make for Grandpa. And a lot of that came from my childhood too because my mom could whip out waffles and pancakes like there were nothing. I don't know. She was like a conjurer, you know, almost a <laughs> Oh, bringing these things out of nothing. Um, so that's, it comes from my childhood, but grandpa and grandma have a lot to do with pancakes and waffles in my book. That's great characterization. Um, any of you? Well, I have, um, there's a semi-retired Chicago detective that is on um, that is now helping out as, out of retirement and just kind of working part time um, in my series and her name is Shirley and because because uh, women relationships are really important in, in my book and um, and so Frankie kind of has this affinity for Shirley and vice versa. Shirley is, is, is a little more, is easier to open up than breaking down some of the men in the sheriff's department. So her initial um, connection to Shirley is offering her butter horns and that's Frankie's signature pastry. And now anytime Frankie wants something, Shirley asks, do you have any butter horns with you? <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's, that is, I guess, one of the food connections that is made in, in my mystery series. That's cool. Um, can you answer the question? Oh, I, I just, food, it shows a difference between Nicholas and Edward and the Harlow Brothers Mysteries because they'll sit down and Nickel, you know, Edward will order a salad with a light vinaigrette and, you know, an iced tea and Nicholas will be like, you know, be a man, I'm getting a burger, you know, <laughs> so, which obviously means that Edward's more confident, <laughs> but that, so whenever they're eating together, it's, it, it's, it's kind of a little rivalry between them as to whether you'll order what you really want or, or okay. whether you'll eat what you think people should see you eating. <laughs> My books, uh, Moki can eat more cookies in one minute than the other three detectives <laughs> put together. <laughs> there you go. I'd like and to try that. very proud of it. <laughs> um, so let's see, I have a question just for Joy and, or maybe some of you can answer this too, but, but she says, you said Frankie Champagne uses baking as a business and a therapy. Um, so why did you choose to make her um, a baker? And can you describe baking therapy? Yeah, my mom, who I'm very fortunate to still have with me is 92. And she has always called baking her therapy. Um, I think her kitchen is her sanctuary and, and I, and I can totally relate. There's something about the physical aspects of baking when you're rolling dough and forming dough, you form that, not only do you have that, that connect, that connectedness or that is rooted to your place, but it's in time, but it's kind of 
It also has a calming, distressing um, effect on, on people when they bake. And studies also show that there's something about the aroma of baked goods and the, the positive effects it has on anybody, whether you're in the kitchen doing the baking yourself or whether other people are smelling what you're baking. It's that association with comfort. And then the other thing, I'll let other people jump into because they probably have things to add. But for Frankie, part of that baking therapy is also part of the crime solving therapy. Following that recipe is a lot like solving a crime, um, step by step process and how you break things down into their component parts. And when she's in her bubble and bake kitchen, that's when ideas come to her about, oh, this, this person is a suspect or this happened and now I've got to go out and follow this trail. Mm -mm. And I see a bunch of you nodding in yeah. agreement. Yeah, Ava is the same way with the fudge shop. I, I repeat it several time, times in my books. She, when she has to think, she goes to make fudge because it's a process, a step-by-step -step process. It slows you down, gets rid of everything else in life and helps you focus. Baking helps you focus. Mixing up fudge helps you focus. So I use that a lot. Lori? In the Sean McPherson novels, I flat out state that the kitchen is Neil's sanctuary. It is, and so is he has an herb garden in places that he grows potatoes and uh, some other vegetables, um, but he's, that is his sanctuary. And he, he's um, very sensitive. He's a gentle man and he's very sensitive and he can, get hurt easily, he takes on others' feelings so he can go into the kitchen and make himself feel better. Mm. Sarah Lynn, did you have something to add to that too? Well, I've been thinking as I'm listening to everybody speak, there's, there are some scenes in Bad Blood Sisters, which is my upcoming novel, um, where the main character is getting ready for um, karate, uh, a karate event. And mm -hmm. one of the things when you're learning how to do karate or any of those um, Japanese, um, I, I'll call it sports, but it's not really sports, self-defense, um, they tell you not to be too full, like that you yeah. should eat to to prepare your body, you should eat, but you should not eat to fullness because the stomach that is too full will not perform as well. Right. And so the main character uh, prepares a meal that's very different from anything else that any of us have talked about today. And it's Japanese food. So food, Food falls into so many categories. It's the filling and the not filling and the healthy and the decadent and the, the rich and the poor. I mean, it falls into so many categories. It's just a universal uh, way to forward your characters and forward your plot in a story. Hmm. True, very true. Um, Cheryl? When you said that, Sarah Lynn, it reminded me of uh, my work in progress, book four. It has Japanese characters and, uh, and Hawaiian characters. And the man, uh, and he, he's in his 80s, who hires the kids to find a, a missing family heirloom. Uh, his name is Mr. Yamada. And while the kids are off investigating something in his backyard, he prepares a snack for them with with tea, matcha tea, and, and different kinds of Japanese um, treats. And the kids discover some really bad news and they come back into the house. And here's the, this beautiful spread on the coffee table and everything, the tea and everything gets cold and it just sits there. Even Moki has lost his appetite, which takes a lot to have happen as they have to deliver some bad news to Mr. Yamada about something that occurred. Um, so um, yeah, food can be part of the setting as well um, in that regard. Yeah. 
And what about you, Jackie? Well, in the next book, that's uh, Frankie Chandler. Um, she's going to suffer a trauma, and June's going to be coming down. And I, I wasn't thinking of using baking therapy, but she was going to teach her how baking something and, and working in the kitchen can actually be soothing. Like, don't use the mixer on that butter. Do it by hand. <laughs> You'll get out a little bit of stress. That kind of thing. Yeah. So she'll eventually find solace in her cooking. I don't know if anybody else Maybe. will, but she will. <laughs> so what part of the larger story is food anticipating or culminating? Um, does, does it give you a moment uh, to, precipitate, to precipitate some movement from one plot point to another? Definitely for me, it does. I often use the food and the guests at the bed and breakfast around the table or in the living room or parlor. And that's where they discuss who might be the person who committed the murder. And they try and help out Ava. They're often trying to help. And of course, maybe one of them is the murderer sitting right there talking to them. But um, that's often a plot point. I, I agree with you. That's what I, I use the food for. It becomes my plot points. That's great. Um, in my book two, at the end of it, um, there's a party, a, cele a celebration, because the kids have solved the mystery and made everything right, righted all the wrongs. And um, the reverend who owns the cathedral next door puts on a pizza party for the kids. When Moki is upset because he thought he was going to have a chance to make his incredible coconut pineapple upside down cake uh, as part of the celebration, but they had to do the celebration rather quickly and he didn't get a chance to. So book three opens with him at a party and he brought his cake to the party. <laughs> <laughs> so I've gone from taking that idea from one book into the next one. And then book three actually ends with part of that as well. Very cool. Well, in my first book, it's actually um, Frankie and her business partner, Carmen, are making hundreds of Valentine's Day cupcakes um, that have been ordered. And, and they're like, a, they're very specialized cupcakes. They have filling and they're jumbo size. And, and it's one of those cupcake orders that actually leads to the conclusion of the plot. So I won't say anything more about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lori? Not necessarily the food, but where people go for the main meal at the main house. Um, I use then sometimes when different characters leave, they might not go directly back to their cottage. They might sneak off and somebody might follow them to do something not so good. But I, can, I use the, the meal to get them from point A, not to back to point A, but off to somewhere else where I can do something. It's a meaningful. launching pad. Yes, it is a launching pad, a jumping off point for something nefarious. There you go. And what about you? The room that they, they go to after dinner? It, what was the name the of that? The inkwell, the inkwell. The inkwell, yeah, I love yes. that. What I love concept. the inkwell too. Yes. yes. I love that idea. Yeah. We had, when we, we lived in Crystal Lake, Illinois for 23 oh. years, just <laughs> south of Madison, Wisconsin, where a lot of you folks are up in that neck of the woods. And my husband is a phenomenal cook, as I've mentioned. And we would have once a year, we would do one party. So we wouldn't do it all the time. And we would help host, a, he would cook and do a wine pairing. We would have a hundred people. And, and they would come and go and we'd use our yard and that type of thing. And what was your question, Cheryl? You asked something very specific and I was going that way. With the inkwell. With the inkwell. Oh, so our, we had in that house, we, had, we, we have a very small house now. We live in a 500 square foot carriage house, but that was a larger house. And we had a room there, not the inkwell exactly, but it had its own little bar type place with books and books and books and its own fireplace, uh, field stones, like it is in the inkwell. 
and 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 people enjoyed that very much. We did that for many, many, many years, and it was one of our favorite things to do. That's great. In the last Frankie Chandler, uh, What the Cluck, It's Murder, she's on June's, um, she's meeting his sisters, uh, at least half of them. He has a posse of sisters who guard him because he's their baby brother. Um, and dinner around the table became like a testing ground <laughs> because, I mean, they would play pranks on her. Like she, they had chickens and they do kill their own chickens and cook their own chickens, but she like met one of the chickens with the name and, and then they're like, oh, that chicken you're eating there is really fresh. And she's like, ah, you know, and she thinks it's the chicken that she, she knows. And they're like, oh, we don't name our food, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of to see how tough she is. <laughs> <laughs> Not very. <laughs> um, we're closing towards the end of our session. So I have one more question before I give you guys a lightning round. <laughs> um, uh, in real life, do you actually test drive the menus that you're writing that appear in your novels? Yes, Lori oh, yeah. says. Yeah, and my publishers require it. You, you must test the recipes. Um, those have to be verified that they actually work. It, it's almost a law in the publishing industry. So yeah. Oh, yeah. Good to know. Yeah. And, and not just the recipes. I don't have recipes. I, I do give menus, you know, this is what they're eating. And so for the past two weeks, we've been, I'm not gonna wanna eat on Thanksgiving. We've been testing. <laughs> the menu that's for Thursday. And it's, it's actually quite phenomenal. And I will use it in one of the books at some point when I do a November, when I do right now we're at September. Uh, but when I do November, I'm sure that I'll use this, but we have been rigorously testing this menu and it's to die for. Ooh. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Is that what you're serving on Thanksgiving too? Yes, that's why we've been testing it. We've been testing it for Thanksgiving. Uh, Len has never made a, uh, a pumpkin cheesecake in a crust, and it is incredible. There will be on my Facebook page, there will be a picture of it on oh. Thanksgiving Day. It's what I'm going to just say, Happy Thanksgiving that day. Um, we, have, uh, we have a sage toast tips with a brie bowl for dipping. We have sliced oven roasted turkey, apple sage gravy, cornbread herb stuffing, garlic mashed potatoes, roasted Brussels sprouts drizzled with honey, citrus glazed sweet potatoes, charred carrots with orange and balsamic, and slow cooker cranberry relish. And then the pairing is a, something called Tribute by Benziger in Sonoma, California. And Len told me to say it's a Bordeaux blend full of grace and power, fruit forward, juicy flavors with silk and velvet across the palate, followed by a long and engaging finish. I'll be there. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> I'm hungry now. I know. <laughs> wow. Joy, do you test your baked goods? Oh, I do. I do. Um, the only, I will say that in my newest book, I, I have two people who submitted recipes to me, but they were, but they were, from dishes that I ate at that, that they, you know, that I, I ate their dishes. So I, so I did use their recipes. One of them I did try before I, before I put it in the book, or I mean, I made it before I put it in the book, but yeah, I always make everything with the exception of there's like, there's a dinner that Frankie plans in the very first book. And I did not make every single one of the things that I talk about, but I didn't include those recipes in there, but I did not make every one of them. So I will say that. Yeah. I make everything that goes in my newsletter. And I and when I or on the website with the one recipe and, and and I write my recipes out like Joanna Fluke style, where it's like, okay, you know, check this and if this doesn't work and make sure you do this and make sure your hands are clean and you know, <laughs> trying to cover all my bases because I don't want anybody to go, you know, what a lousy recipe. <laughs> oh yeah. Sarah Lynn, have you tried the 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 meals in, or the the dishes in your um, Epicurean feast? Yes, uh, because I wouldn't want to put out recipes that I hadn't tried myself and make sure that they work. 
But it's sort of an interesting vignette about that menu because it's such an elaborate menu. The person who hosted that party that I went to long ago um, helped me with the menu. It's pretty close to the one from the party where, where we actually were. And he told me that when the book makes it to the bestseller list, I have to make that dinner for him. <laughs> <laughs> Good deal. Yep. Awesome. And Cheryl, have you tried any of the cookie recipes that Moki makes? Yeah, in fact, at the, at the end of my recipes, uh, at the back of the book for book three, I have, it says sources. The above recipes were created and, and adapted by the author and her family. Um, and of course, I test drove that mustard sandwich many times as a child. <laughs> <laughs> that was my favorite. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Are you ready for your lightning round? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, just quick, short answers. Um, and you guys kind of just answered this one. Have you tried all of your recipes? Go around from uh, Joy and then- Yeah, yes, all. Lori? Yes. Christine? Yes. Sarah Lynn? Yes. Cheryl? Cheryl? Yep. Yes. Jackie? Yep, <laughs> okay. Um, what are your favorite recipes that you've written? Joy? Oh, um, this lavender chai sugar cookie that I also Ooh. brought to a lot of different um, events and had other people sample and vote on the best on the cookies they liked best. That was their number one choice. Oh, Lori. <laughs> uh, it's coming up then. It'll be in, in November. It's the charred carrots with orange and balsamic. I've never had that and it's phenomenal. Sounds mm. delicious. Christine? Um, so Cinderella pink fudge. It was my first recipe in my first book. And um, I still love it because it's so pretty and so easy to make and very tasty with the cherries in it. Mm. Sarah Lynn? One of my characters makes truffles. So truffles is one of the recipes. And when the book first came out, I uh, gave out truffles to people who bought the book at in-person <laughs> events. So a lot of people have associated murder in the 1% with truffles. So that has to be my favorite. Cheryl? Uncle Rocky's famous chocolate chip pumpkin bread. Mmm. Mm, yeah. And if you think that's a strange combination, try it. You'll love it. You'll never just eat plain pumpkin bread again. <laughs> that chocolate and that pumpkin bread with that cinnamon just, mmm. Yeah. So good. Jackie? I have not created a recipe yet. I'll be doing that for the next book and I'm terrified. So okay. <laughs> I can't answer the question. Okay. Um, will you be test driving any new recipes over the holidays? Lori has just answered all of that. Um, Jackie, we'll go the other way. Um, we're switching from turkey to chicken since there's only two of us. So I guess that's a new recipe. <laughs> there you go. Cheryl. Thyme, roast thyme, roasted Brussels sprouts with cranberries and maple syrup drizzle. Oh, yeah. Sarah Lynn. Well, I don't know if that's going to make it into a book, but I'm going to try it myself. Sarah Lynn. No, we're having a very pared down holiday because um, one of us has had some health problems. So we're on special diets. And when I told the dietitian what we were having for Thanksgiving, she said, oh. <laughs> 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 but it's important to stay healthy. So we're thankful anyway. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Christine? Well, I think I'm, I, oh boy, I think I'm going to experiment with a fruitcake fudge. I know that sounds Ooh. terrible, but I think I'm going to try it. And I'm also going to try watermelon fudge. Uh, and that's for a future book, but I want to see what that's like. Wow. Ooh. Yum. Lori, anything besides your Thanksgiving feast that you're? Nope. This is the, <laughs> the latest and the greatest. <laughs> yeah. Delicious. Joy. Yeah, we're making um, this yam gratin that is a um, 
that sliced yams and it has smoked gouda and some chipotle Ooh. spices in it and we're test driving that for thanksgiving this this Ooh. year yeah so Ooh. starting on that tomorrow yeah i'm, I'm making um uh uh bourbon cranberry dressing Ooh. just to um, put that out there and actually we made it last year but it'll be like brand new again because we haven't made it in a year right mm. but yeah really good um so let's tell everyone where they can find your books or your recipes um sarah lynn go ahead and start well the detective parrot books can be found on my website right now which is sarah lynn richard at aol dot oh. Sarahlyn <laughs> Richard.com or murder in the one percent.com. So uh, the other ones can be found anywhere that books are sold. Great. Um, Cheryl. You can find all my books on my website, which is Cheryljoseph.com slash books. And there are links to number of purchase places from Amazon all the way to Barnes and Noble and indie bookstores. I really like to support indie bookstores. Yes. Christine. You can get all of my books, um, including Deadly Fudge Divas and Undercover Fudge, which I don't have a copy of in my office. Uh, Undercover Fudge came out in June, this past June. All of them are on Amazon, um, indie bookstores. Barnes and Noble carries my first three books for sure. So they're, they're pretty much everywhere. Okay. Lori? You can find my books on lauribuchanan.com with links to your favorite booksellers and with an emphasis on indie booksellers. Jackie? I didn't think people could see that far back. A Scaly Tale of Murder comes out November 30th and all of my book links are on my website, jacquelinevick.com to all the usual places and joy um recipes all in the backs of my books as well and my books are also available um they're in they are available barnes and noble amazon a lot of indie bookstores in the midwest and i'll just give a shout out to deep green envy only because i'm really proud of this book <laughs> it's my newest one but i it, it's also um it it's gone to different, it's, it's going in different places than, than my past ones. And so I just, right now it's my favorite child. <laughs> uh, um, you know, we did have, there's one question from Facebook from Victoria and she wants to know if your readers have given any feedback about the re recipes. Lots. Yeah. Yes. yes. At book events coolest thing is that a lot of the book events have been doing um the people have been a, as part of the event libraries bookstores um somebody has actually or book clubs have actually made some of the recipes and brought them to the event which is oh, i mean that it's no greater honor than to have that happen so that tends to be where i get the most feedback yeah that's great yeah yeah I've had a number of book club meetings where they've tried to replicate that recipe, I mean, that menu from Murder in the 1% party. And that's so much fun to see how that turns out and how it plays out. It's like walking into your book. <laughs> really fun. That's cool. That Very is cool. cool. Have any of you had reader feedback on your recipes? I don't offer recipes, but the menus, they, they talk about, oh, that sounds like good taste combinations, ooh la la, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And Christine, I know your recipes are in your books. Have you ever had readers comment or yeah, try they, to make them? Yeah, they like the fudge and I ask for recipe ideas for fudge. So I do get ideas coming through Facebook and, and mm -hmm. other ways through my email too. Um, and through my website, christinedesmet.com. So, and I invite them because I'm always looking for new recipes that, you know, I, yeah. love, I love them. That's great. Well, ladies, I'm hungry now. <laughs> 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 this has been so much fun. 
thank yeah. you so much for sharing um, all your insights about writing cooking into your mysteries. And thanks for your recipe ideas. And um, now I know where to go plan my next meal <laughs> or dessert. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank and you, thank everybody. You. Thank you for having us. Uh, yeah. Lots of fun. Happy Have Thanksgiving. Happy, Happy Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, everybody. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.